So uh, we look forward to starting this uh, town hall momentarily. And I see all of our families are starting to populate the Zoom call. Welcome everyone. We have quite a few folks who have registered to join us tonight to hear about the back to school plans. And we're really excited to be able to share all of these plans with you. And for you to hear from a few more people than me, um, I've invited our whole team to join us tonight and share uh, all of the hard work that this incredible team has been doing. It has been quite the summer for all, for all of you and for all of us as we navigate this new reality that we've been facing. But we are, we are really excited about the opportunity to have students on campus this fall. We've worked super hard to try to make that possible. And uh, it's certainly not an easy feat by any means, um, but it's a commitment that we made early on to try to do that uh, with all of the health and safety measures in place. I'm gonna quote from a favorite person of mine who's no longer with us, but that um, still comes into our homes quite often if you have a young child, and that's Fred Rogers. And he said, when he was a boy or when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helpers. And I'm so fortunate as head of school to have this amazing team of helpers supporting all of our great work and supported by an incredible board of trustees. And I'd like to invite our board chair, new board chair this year, Kathleen Scheidt, to share a little bit with you about the work of the board. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, thank you for your continued partnership with Royce Moore and your input and adaptability as we all strive to continue to provide an excellent education for our children. Much of what you've read over the past several weeks about the Royce Moore reopening and what you'll hear this evening and in the days to come stems from strong collaboration between the administration and the board. I am so grateful for the diverse skills and experiences of our board members and I look forward to you having the opportunity to interact with them and get to know them to the extent that you don't already. But their contributions, particularly through the COVID strategy team and the health and safety task force, supporting the leadership, insights, and tireless efforts of the Royce Moore administration and faculty have informed and refined the return to school plan and will continue as the school year progresses and the pandemic resolves and evolves. <laughs> Shows my optimism, it will resolve at some point. Thank you to all of you listening today who have contributed your knowledge, your time, and other resources to the return to school planning. Now, Adrienne will describe the fundamentals of, of the reopening plan. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you so much for your partnership with the Board of Trustees and the leadership. I am so grateful for all of that good work that the board has done. I am too. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen with the presentation and um, start things off and then turn it over bit by bit to the members of our team. So here we are, back to school, and we are very excited to have your kids return to campus soon. Another great quote, Rahm Emanuel once said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that is it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. And for any of you who have ever visited my office, you will see a quote on a chalkboard in my office from another favorite person of mine, Eleanor Roosevelt, which says, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And then back to Fred Rogers. In times of stress, the best thing we can do for each other is to listen with our ears and our hearts and to be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. We try to lead 
with listening at Royce Moore and all of the work that we have done here in preparation for the return to school has been informed from listening to all of you as you shared with us your strong desire back in the spring to have your children back on campus safely. So we heard you and we've been having a laser-like focus on planning for that, how we can actually get everyone back onto campus safely. So we formed a health and safety task force in early May with the goal of how we can create an environment that is safe as possible for in-person instruction. And I'm deeply grateful to the two board certified medical professionals who served on our health and safety task force, Dr. Anita Shah, who is a current parent at Royce Moore, and Dr. Mahalakshmi Halasiamani. They've provided expert guidance to the development of our plan, who along with members of our board of trustees and our director of finance and operations, Vicki Pickett, who you'll hear from momentarily, meet every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. That was my therapy this morning. And we look through new understandings and new research that we're hearing about COVID and adjusting our plans as a result. There's a great deal of information that comes at us every day. And you've probably noticed that it's often conflicting. So we have to kind of weed through this, but ultimately the focus has been based on science and the plan is developed around key, three key points, protect, distance, and disinfect. And we'll get into th those details shortly. The guiding principles of the plan were safety first, which is why we created the health and safety reentry plan before any other plan. To plan for an on-campus experience, but being ready to go remote if government mandated closures dictate that, or if there's a positive case of COVID in one of our cohorts. And we've grounded the social emotional into all that we do. We've ramped up the social emotional and mindfulness school-wide in recognition of what a difficult time this has been for our children and for all of you. That's been really key to our planning as we thought about it. One of the newest aspects of our plan is to add something that we've drawn from actually a school in um, Atlanta that had people who work at the CDC help them develop and then we've modified it for us so that we're looking at both internal factors here and making our decisions for being open as well as external factors. These criteria uh, of external factors include looking at the seven day rolling average of positivity uh, in our area, looking at the seven day rolling average of hospital admissions, the proportion of new cases to overall cases and ICU availability. And we look at both Cook County and Evanston indicators. We also are looking at internal uh, criteria such as the number of cohorts that might be in quarantine, how well everyone in our community is complying with the mitigation strategies, uh, the daily number of students on campus. So for example, if the number of students in a class um, start to get so small that it makes more sense for the class to be fully remote versus on person. We'll assess that as we go. And also with respect to teachers as well. With our wellness screening daily, um, we're gonna find that a lot more students and teachers are not gonna be able to come on campus if they have symptoms. So we've also ramped up our substitute pool to be able to provide for extra support for teachers when they are out, but there may come a point in time where it just makes sense for a class or a cohort to be remote for a period of time. Uh, we also obviously take in the CDC and the Illinois Department of Public Health recommendations in everything that we do. These uh, guidelines, the green, yellow, orange, and red will dictate, you know, they'll be our um, guidelines for whether we are operating on campus or off campus. Currently, we are in the yellow. Um, once we get into the orange, the upper school would transition to fully remote learning and we would divide 
cohorts into even smaller cohorts to further prevent um, possible spread of positivity. And once we're in the red, we would transition to remote learning. But we're looking at this on a weekly basis as we assess what makes sense for Royce Moore. We are also going to be sending all of you a return to school health and safety pledge that we're going to ask you to sign um, because we recognize that for us to stay safe and healthy, we need everyone to be a part of this um, pledge. We can't just control what's happening here on campus. We kind of need everyone to be a part of this community, whether it's on campus or off campus in terms of how we live our lives. This detail is included in version four of the health and safety plan, as well as the school closure metrics. And that was just published on our website today if you wanna take a closer look uh, at the plan itself. As you know, we've also provided three options for school this fall. And thank you to all of you who have responded whether you wanted to have your children participate in school off campus, to hold a spot on campus until you feel it's safe for your child to be on campus or to start on campus. And you know, students might be on campus learners that need to transition to off campus if they become uncomfortable with being on campus for some reason, if you have a change in your family situation at home, or if there's a positive COVID test uh, in, in the family or a close contact. So we recognize that it's gonna be quite a fluid and flexible situation this year. We have a lot of changes to this year. So we've had to modify the start um, for, for several reasons, but for starters, um, our normal uh, Griffin back to school gathering has to be reimagined and our new parent orientation has to be reimagined as well. So both of those events will be Zoom events. The new parent orientation will be August 18th, that's next Tuesday at 6 p.m. And we will be doing some special orientation for our new families uh, that evening. Then next Friday, August 21st, uh, from 5 to 6 p.m., we are going to have a back to school social for families via Zoom. And you'll enjoy special appearances by Dan Dudek, Howard Stanley, and our rising senior, Effie Zimmerman, who will go through the new school wellness screener app that he developed for Royce Moore and is actually being used by around 20 different schools around the country for their purposes. We're gonna play fun trivia games and bingo, and you'll have a chance to socialize with other families. With respect to parents being on campus this year, and keeping the school as health and safety, healthy and safe as possible. We are limiting parent access to the building, but there will be opportunities if you need to have in-person meetings on campus for some reason, um, either before school starts or after 4 p.m. Um, so that can be ways that you can um, still get onto campus and Darcy Aksamitowski, our lower school head, will be talking about a special schedule for early childhood and lower school families to come and visit their classrooms that first week of school. There will also be a modified schedule for middle school students um, that Adrian Flora will talk about. Um, obviously, athletics will have to change a bit this year, and our new athletic director, Bath Long, will be speaking to that um, this evening. And our new Eagle Hour, which is empowering all Griffins to learn experientially, which would be on Tuesday afternoons, we're going to delay that start as well as delay a start to clubs. We're gonna assess timing while we assess what's going on in the external environment around Royce Moore with COVID uh, positivity rates. And there may be things that we want to schedule by division, such as college counseling meetings or things like that. Um, but otherwise, students can either release early that day or go into extended day. So that's a lot from me. I promised you, you would get to hear from other members of the team tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki Pickett, our amazing director of finance and operations, who has been such an incredible partner to me as we have prepared for you 
uh, for the start of school this year. Vicki. Thank you, Adrian. It's great to be here and to see the numbers of you um, clicking away on the um, meeting. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of your kids in the school. We had an awesome summer with some kids here for summer camp. So our quiet building went to a happy place filled with uh, laughter. And I'm looking forward to the building just being full this year. Um, I wanted to just give you an overview of some of the things that we've been doing to address the recommendations from our health and safety committee and um, to just give you a sense of the sorts of things that we have planned. First thing that I wanted to talk about is the enhanced cleaning of the building. We are still working with Crescent Cleaning, the vendor that we have been using for many years. And in fact, we met with them today to hear about all the additional training that they've been doing with their staff about CDC and EPA regulations. And they will be giving special attention to our building each evening, all the high touch points, all the um, surfaces. They use a special uh, product that is approved and certified through the EPA and through CDC. And we've been using that product throughout the building the last year or so. We really like it because it does do a great job on virus and bacteria. And we also have not had any faculty or students or staff um, indicate that they've had any allergic reactions to that. So we've been really happy with that product. And one of the things that we're going to do is supply um, spray bottles of that product into the classrooms um, with paper towels so that as surfaces um, are being used or a student completes working on a surface, we can wipe that down throughout the day so that any of the touch points we identify um, during transitions will be working um, as a team with our faculty, staff, and students to um, identify those and to address them. Uh, last week, we had a walkthrough with our HVAC vendor, um, GHC. We had already done a COVID uh, walkthrough, but there were some additional guidelines that came from the CDC about uh, the filters. You may have heard in the industry the words, uh, the acronym MERV. I'd like to tell you I know what that acronym is, but I don't. We have been using um, the, until recently, the highest standard of filter in our system. It was called the MERV 8. But the new recommendation is the MERV um, 13. And so we spent some time walking through the building with them and they have indicated that we could definitely use the MERV 13s in our system. It will compromise a little bit um, of our um, the functionality of our system because the system has to pump um, a lot more um, with a lot more pressure to push the air through these finer filters. And the other thing that we also have been able to um, address with them is the need to push more fresh air through the building. So we have also identified a way to uh, increase fresh air that'll be coming through the building. And the other thing that we have done is um, I've purchased wrenches. Now, one would say, Vicki, why are you purchasing wrenches for a school? Well, those of you who've been in the school will know that the windows in the rooms don't have handles so that you can open them. I don't know where the handles went. The handles are gone. So uh, we can open the windows with wrenches. So every faculty member will be armed with a wrench so that they can open windows um, to increase fresh air coming into the building. Uh, the more we read, the more study we do, the more we are finding that fresh air makes a huge difference in the battle against COVID. So um, on the days that we can manage it, we'll be pumping more fresh air in. Um, it'll change um, the cost of our um, utility bill, it will increase it, but we stand ready uh, to do that in order to improve the quality of the air and the filtration of the air in our system. Um, as Adrian alluded to earlier, we are going to be um, closely managing 
people who have access to the building. Um, faculty, staff, and students will definitely be in the building, but we will be restricting visitors. And the only visitors who will really be authorized to come past the front desk are um, approved vendors who provide essential services um, to us. And so that would be like the people who take care of the HVAC, our plumbers and things like that. All of those uh, vendors have been um, spoken with and they have all agreed to um, our health and safety uh, construct. All of them have agreed that before they enter the building, they'll take the health and safety questionnaire and they have agreed to have their temperature taken before they access the building. Um, another thing that we've done is we have spent a lot of time thinking about how people move throughout our building. Um, you can, well, you all saw pictures of what was happening in Georgia with all the students in the hallways, and that's not what we want to do. So we've spent a lot of time looking at ways we can manage the traffic in the building so there will be uh, stairways that are up only, stairwells that are down only, there will be um, hallways that go in one direction, and there are also areas of the building that are for specific cohorts. And the color code, there'll be color-coded arrows on the floors, which will make it very easy with the visual cues that if you step in, if a student steps into a hallway and the color of their cohort is not on the floor, they'll know that they're in the wrong space and that they need to turn around. Now, I will um, say that um, when you make up um, one-way halls and one-way stairwells, that the closest, uh, the closest direction or the closest way to your classroom might not be the direction one gets to travel. So um, we have, change the schedule a little bit to give class more time for changing of classes so that people will abide by uh, the one-way hallways. We've also added um, throughout the building hand sanitizer stations. Each doorway has hand sanitizer available and it's all um, the hand sanitizer that has been approved for use in schools. We also have added um, hand sanitizer dispensers on walls throughout the building. So if a student feels like they want to um, just get a dose of hand sanitizer while they're changing classes, those are on the walls and they're the ones that are motion sensitive. So there's no touching of the hand sanitizer dispensers. Um, the last thing is that, as you all know, we um, can't really use our dining hall this year because we can't find a way to do the social distancing that's required. So we've been working with our vendor HandCut and they have offered us an opportunity to continue a special program with them where they can um, provide individually packed lunches for students who wish to opt into the program. So um, you've already received the um, form giving you the opportunity to opt in or opt out of the program. If you haven't completed that, please do, because I am starting to communicate with them the counts by grade, how many people will participate. I do want to mention that um, we don't uh, charge any handling fees to manage the finances for the handcuff program. And so to keep the process manageable for the business office, me, me, um, the opt-in, opt-out decision is for the entire year so that um, the business office, me, doesn't spend a lot of time doing um, uh, credits for $7.25. It's just um, not a good way for me to serve the school and to serve you. I'm ready for the next slide. All right, look at those kids. So um, there are many ways that we will be working together to protect one another. And you can see some of this right there. Um, we will be requiring that within two hours of the arrival at school, students, faculty, and staff will confirm that they are symptom-free. 
and they'll use the new app developed by our rising senior, the soon to be famous Effie Zimmerman. And um, as students arrive and faculty members and staff members, we will check the temperature of everyone coming into the building. There is an expectation that everyone will wear masks in the building. And there'll be lots and lots of hand washing. I've bought gallons of soap to be throughout the building. And in some of the grades, hand washing will become an activity that is just part of the day. Um, again, I've said um, that there is hand sanitizer throughout the building and each classroom will be armed with their own supply. And hand cuts going to provide the meals in um, what they are saying is their contactless food service. And we will either have lunches in the cohort rooms or on days where it's possible, we will um, go outside. That's part of the reason that uh, we've added camp chairs to the list of supplies for this year so that we can spend as much time as we can outside and enjoying the property that um, is around our building. And um, just another thing that we're, that we're doing and is on my list is the MERV 13 filters and improving the airflow. So I'm ready for distance. So um, the orange cones were part of uh, camp. Um, they, they'll go away and the entrance to the building will look a little more welcoming than giant orange cones, but the orange cones helped us figure out a lot about social distancing. And so we have spent a lot of time organizing rooms and discussing public spaces to allow everyone to practice the social distancing, but still be able to see one another and still be able to interact. All the classrooms have been reconfigured to limit the total of number of students in the room. And um, again, we're using this cohort-based um, division. I'm sorry, I lost my words there. Um, we're using the cohort-based um, functionality to be able to provide six feet of distancing in each of the classrooms. All of the spaces in the building have been designated to benefit, benefit the needs of uh, the different cohorts. So for example, the space in the upper school looks a lot different than the space in the lower school. Now you may say it's always looked different, but it looks uh, different now. And, and in each situation, we spent a lot of time talking about what the students need to succeed and how the, how the faculty can be the biggest part of helping those students succeed. Um, there won't be any large community gatherings this year, and that's a bummer because I'm a party girl, and it breaks my heart that we won't have large groups, um, but we will again soon. I truly believe it. But there won't be um, the big gatherings inside or outside. Um, and like I said before, we've reconfigured all of our hallways and our stairs to go in one direction so that people don't run into each other. And um, I think what I wrote here is that uh, this will mean that the shortest distance to a classroom will not always be the travel required. So we've been thinking a lot about our families and thinking a lot about ways that we learn at Royce Moore in the family that we are. And we spent that time thinking about how we do not sacrifice who we are, but still meet all the standards of the state and that each day we all go home safe and healthy. So I think that's, oh, disinfect. Oh, good Lord. Ah. Well, I think I've already touched on the, the disinfect pieces enough. There, there um, are skids of disinfecting um, solutions throughout the building, all of them safe for education, all of them um, recommended by CDC for use in schools. And anybody who wants to have clean hands, clean desks, clean notebooks, there are plenty of supplies in the building. We also have designed two spaces that will be 
um, what we're calling comfort spaces. So if a child becomes ill during the day, they will be uh, brought away from their cohort into one of these comfort rooms that's, we don't wanna call it an isolation room, it's a comfort room while um, they wait for their parents to come and pick them up. So um, I think I might be done now. Is there anything else? Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Next up is our Director of Curriculum and Innovation, Beth Shutters. Thank you, Vicki and Adrian. Um, I am going to talk about technology at Royce Moore this year. And um, I'm sure many of you have wondered this same thing, but um, you know, the question of what would we be doing during this pandemic without technology is one that occurs to me almost daily. Um, so I'm sure you'll agree that technology is a super important part of, of the school year this year, no matter what the school year looks like. So we are making some um, additions to our technology program, uh, but a lot of what we've been using will remain about the same. Um, as some of you may know, our middle school has had a one-to-one -one Chromebook program for a few years now. We are going to expand that program down to um, second grade, so students in grades two through eight will all receive a school issued Chromebook that will be theirs and theirs only. Students in grades kindergarten and first grade will also get a device that's just theirs, but those will be iPads, which um, is a sort of a recent decision due to our um, supply and demand um, with that. In our upper school, they will continue to do, use our BYOD, Bring Your Own Device program. So every student will have their own device there. And in uh, Pre-K and JK, they will, they will share devices, but they'll be thoroughly cleaned in between uses. Um, and part of the reason that we are expanding the one-to-one -one program is that we have um, received guidance from the state that technology shouldn't be shared as, as much as possible. And it also makes it easy for us to have um, devices at home during any periods of remote learning or for our off-campus learners. And I wanted to comment on just um, being consistent with our, with our technology. Um, in the middle school, there is an option to bring, um, for students to bring their own device. And um, of course, if, if, a, if your student does have a device at home that they are more comfortable using, we would not prevent that. Um, but we do like to have our kids on the same devices as much as possible. And mainly that's because we use a tool called Go Guardian. Um, if you ask a middle schooler, they might tell you it's the worst thing ever because <laughs> it um, helps me keep track of where, where they're going and what they're doing and helps their teachers make sure they're on task during classes. And what you may not know though is that Go Guardian is um, something that will work on school issue devices while students are at home. It, it helps us monitor and filter um, what students can access from their devices. So as much as um, students can be on school devices, um, that helps us just be consistent and secure. We are also getting some new equipment. Um, we were lucky enough to have a wireless access point in every classroom for a few years now, and we are actually going to be upgrading each and every one of those. That's, I think, being installed as we speak um, so that we can ensure a bit, hopefully, reliable Wi-Fi performance in every classroom. Of course, no technology is you know, without problems sometimes, uh, but we do think that um, really strong Wi-Fi throughout the building is, super, is going to be super important this year. Uh, we are also purchasing a few new teacher laptops so that um, everybody, every faculty member can be above a certain uh, standard of computer. Uh, and many of those will be used uh, for supporting off-campus learners and for creating remote learning lessons, whether that's um, streaming a class synchronously or creating asynchronous lessons. Uh, we are also purchasing a few new Chromebooks to meet the need for our expanded Chromebook program. And I, I did want to mention that there might be a delay in getting some of those devices because um, some of you may know there's kind of a delay in getting any sort of electronics right now. So I don't, I, 
am not sure when everything's going to come in, but I can guarantee that every student will have something and every teacher as well, even if it's a slightly older device that we replace with something newer in a couple of weeks, but we, we will be getting um, everybody what they need at the beginning of the year. Um, we will continue to use a lot of the same online tools that we've used before. So some of the things you've heard of are like Mobimax and um, Learning A to Z, IXL. Uh, we are expanding though our use of a tool called Seesaw a little bit to be used throughout the whole lower school. Um, and we are also, some of you will be very pleased to hear that we're working on increasing the compatibility between um, FACTS, SIS, formerly known as RenWeb, and Google, Google Classroom. Um, almost all of our teachers use Google Classroom in one way or another. And we're working on making that more compatible with um, our student information system facts. And I think that's it for technology. Um, yeah, I'm also going to speak to professional development and some of the things that our faculty have been doing over the summer. If there ever was a summer that our faculty could have used a nice long vacation, this was probably it. But um, most of us aren't doing nice long vacations um, and our faculty has been very hard at work um, doing some learning to make sure they're ready for the year to come um, and they'll they'll continue doing that as we start the school year. I just wanted to highlight a few things that faculty have been doing. They were asked to complete at least two PD modules, professional development modules, um, one of which had to be uh, a deep dive into remote learning so that for any time um, a teacher or a class or part of a class or a cohort or in any combination someone is at home, they are able to support those um, needs. Some of our faculty, many of our faculty took a course through Global Online Academy called Designing for Online Learning. Um, and all of our faculty will be sharing what they learned with one another at our um, during our PD time next week when everyone comes back. Um, everyone was also asked to complete a module for their division, so lower, middle, and upper, um, so that they were able to think more about how they can support those learners at home, because it looks a little different in each division, and you'll hear about that pretty soon. And then we had one module that we called Equity Conversations, and um, that continued some of the work that we started last year during our faculty PD um, about our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, this equity conversations module was simply that, uh, some conversations, knowing that we have more work to do in that area and that we'll continue having those conversations throughout the year and beyond. Um, so I look forward to continuing that work. Uh, we also, as part of their deep dive in, into um, supporting remote learning, at least uh, five of our teachers have achieved their Google Certified Educator Level 1 status. That's what that yellow symbol is there. And um, I believe that there may have only been one uh, person who had that before. So that's, you know, we have five times as many now. Uh, we have at least two people who've got, actually gotten Level 2, and we have several more who are working on their certification. And this just helps us enhance our use of Google for Education tools in the classroom, and that will can only help support our, our remote learning, any periods of remote learning and our use of those tools. Lastly, I wanted to mention that I attended three days of remote professional development through MIT, um, the Lemelson MIT program, uh, which was part of an award called the Excite Award, um, which is an award given to about 50 educators around the country who teach invention education. And um, even though we haven't used those words invention education too much at Royce Moore. It is so in line with what we do with our middle school passion project P3 program, um, our upper school JST and our, our lower school theme week. Um, you know, our kids are inventing and solving problems and using design thinking. And I'm really excited to um, continue my work with Lemelson and to um, apply what I've learned throughout this year. And I think that's it for me. So I'd like to introduce Darcy Aksimitowski, our lower school head, who will share details about the return to school experience for early childhood and lower school. Thank you, Beth. Um, 
I first like to say that we are just so excited to have the children back on campus or off campus, but just seeing the life of them this summer in the hallways was just such a joy, even mask wearing and, um, you know, just having, having their laughter. Um, when we were thinking about the program for the early childhood and lower school, one of the procedures we really wanted to prioritize was to create a safe flow of traffic into and out of the building. As a lower school, early childhood and lower school component, we're so used to coming into the building, spending time with each other. And unfortunately this year, that's not gonna happen. So in order to create a safe environment for parents and students coming into the building, we decided to um, delay our start and end times. So this year, early childhood will start at 8.45 and end at 3.30. So that's a 15 minute time later than before. The AM only time for those classes would be until 11.45. And then the lunch bunch is until 1 p.m. Pick up at 3.30. Another thing that's really important to us at Royce Moore is having the opportunity for the morning room and extended day. The morning room will still be available at 7.30 in the morning, which has always been free of charge. And the extended day will run from after school until 6 p.m. In order to maintain the cohorts, we really wanted to have those two spaces. So we have a separate lower school cohort and an early childhood um, EDP, I'm sorry, cohort as well. The drop-off and pickup times are a little bit different. So for the lower school and the early childhood, we'll be using, entrance will be through the garage. And what that's gonna look like during that drop-off time is that parents will pull into the garage and go to the assigned doors. For the early childhood, that would be the two doors that we're used to coming into, the two big yellow doors. At that time when you're pulling up, there'll be a staff member who's waiting there for you to help your child out of the car. They will do a quick scan of the wellness check that you would have done at least two hours before coming to school. And then they'll be taken inside to get a temperature check. At that point, they will then be led into their classroom where they can start their day. If for some reason the temperature check is showing above 100.4, the staff will do a couple extra double checks to make sure, but if it is showing that temperature, then we will call you back to campus to come pick up your child for the day to protect the safety of everybody else. Um, during pickup time, it will look a little different as well. And what that will look like is that at 3.30, your child will be ready to go in their classroom with their backpacks. So again, you'll come down to the garage, you'll pull up, staff will be there waiting when they see you in your car. We will call into the room, your child will come out, and then we'll help your child into the car. Again, all this is providing opportunity for you to stay in your car, for us to help the flow of traffic and continue um, the whole process going. So I think we can go to the next slide. So the lower school is the similar um, process for drop off and pick up. The new school day would be at 8.15 to three. So it's a 15 minute earlier start time. Drop off can start 15 minutes before that start of school. So at 8 a.m. you can start dropping off your child. Again, instead of the two yellow doors, you would be coming to that one single yellow door, which most people don't ever even see and it goes right into where what used to be the dining hall and that's now our lower school EDP. So we'll again help your child out of the car, scan their form from their wellness check and then take their temperature inside and then they'll be able to walk into their classroom. Pickup will be the same, the children will be waiting inside that same space and then we'll call them out to the car when you're ready. I think that's it for that slide as well. So when thinking about the early childhood and lower school programs, um, we had our three options that Adrian talked about, our on-campus schedule, our remote schedule, and then our off-campus schedule. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about each one of those things. The on-campus schedule, when we were looking at this spring and thinking of feedback from our experience with you, the students, and ourselves as teachers and educators, we really work to hear what you were saying and design a plan that would work for everyone. And so the schedule on campus is designed so that it can move with ease between on campus and remote learning. 
the blocks are intentional blocks of time where there can be engaged learning. And then the specialist classes were actually formed to be only 30 minutes so that if we go remote, that is a long enough time to be doing a music or a PE class while on a Zoom platform or Google Meet. Um, students will engage in lessons with just within their cohort, so the early childhood or the lower school cohort, and they'll use the assigned outside space as well as much as possible. So this allows teachers um, to be able to take their classes outside knowing that they have a space to go just for them. And so teacher, teachers will be aware of where the early childhood outside space is and not just for early childhood students and then where the lower school outside space is and that's just for them. Um, all students will participate in the same PE, music, art, French, and library. Our remote learning schedule, again, will follow the same schedule that the students would, would have been doing in, um, on campus, except it will be through a synchronous platform. What this means and what we've talked about as educators is how we can use Zoom to be an extension of the classroom. So as we go through our day being intentional and mindful about our lessons, where for us in lower school and early childhood, it's not, we don't do as much direct instruction in, in terms of just standing and teaching. So when we're thinking of teaching with Zoom or Zooming in with a lesson, we're still keeping and being mindful of maybe doing a 10 minute mini lesson, having students engage in a task and then come back for follow-up questions. So with the schedule again in mind, the students each day would follow their same Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera schedule. They would still attend their same um, PE class or music class synchronously, and they would go through their day. It might look a little different for each of the different age levels. And so what I mean by that is in JK and pre-K, those students would only follow synchronously their AM schedule. So at that 11.45 time, that's when their synchronous lessons would be done. However, they would have scheduled one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction time with their teachers throughout the week. The PK and JK programs also intentionally have had their specials all done in the morning. So that's, those students still get those specials if we go into remote learning through synchronous lessons again as well. In the kindergarten program, they too will follow synchronously their schedule um, from the beginning of the day and the end of the day, getting all their specials as well and having some personal one-on-one -on -one time or small group workshop time during their remote learning. And then first and fourth, um, fourth grade will follow synchronously as well. Kindergarten and up through fourth grade will have age synchronous time for lunch and recess. Um, and that will be a break for them. One of the things that we would like your help with and that we'll talk about this year is being able to create a space and fostering independence in your, in your child or our students. Um, this is such a great opportunity for us to work together and look at how we can develop those skills and really get the students invested in their own learning and thinking. One of the things that you saw on your supply list this year was the at-home space. And what we really want is instead of just a spot on a couch in the, in the TV room or a location where maybe the little brother or sister is playing or older brother, is really creating that kind of school space at home so that we can put on the mindset or your child can put on the mindset that it's time for school. And when I go to that space, I know exactly what's expected of me. And this year we'll be talking about what that space is and what it means to be working either on campus or using your home as the new learning, learning platform. Next slide. So the other option for the early childhood and lower school was our off-campus learning option. And so this is the option that if your peers are at school, but you're at home for various reasons. Um, at this point in time, I've talked with many families who were doing the hold option and are comfortable, not comfortable, maybe coming back to campus or just want to wait a little bit. And so you might be participating in the off-campus option. So the off-campus option for early childhood and lower school was again intentionally designed and talked about with our administrative team. It is 
made up of asynchronous learning that aligns with the curriculum being taught in the classroom. So what that means is that it is lessons that are either intentionally filmed by teachers or using different ways to engage students in those lessons. A use of a checklist or a choice board will promote independence so that again, we're looking at that safe space and the independence of students doing their own work. So it will be at least three synchronous lessons with classroom teachers during the week. And there'll be other opportunities for social synchronous times with peer groups, which might be a lunch bunch or a read aloud. Um, the really neat thing about this plan, and I'm really excited about, and I've talked with some families about already, is that this plan gets to be created with your classroom teacher and with um, me. Sorry. Um, one of the things that we value at Royce Moore is differentiation. And when thinking about our off-campus plans, it's a way for us to differentiate to meet the needs of your students, your family, of your child, the family all at the same time. So when we think of the class and we think of the structure, when I sit and we sit together to think of what this plan looks like, perhaps it's a plan where your child might be in a small group with peers at school. Perhaps it's a plan where the child is learning with other peer groups who are off campus. And it really varies from class to class and age to age, what that could look like. And even within the specials program. So it's a really exciting time, again, to take the individual personalized learning that we're so proud of and work with you in partnership during what is going to be a unique year. Next slide. And then the final thing with which Adrian also talked about was just the social emotional learning and the attention that we pay to that at school this year and every year. Um, I know that whether you're on campus or off campus, morning meetings within the early childhood and lower school, starting our days with thinking about how we're feeling or what's going on or being attuned to those aspects are really ways that we like to um, build community with one another. And this would be perhaps an opportunity if you're an off-campus learner where you would come and join the class for those special moments or a leader in me school where we build on being proactive beginning with the end in mind and instilling those skills that actually help us to promote that independence at home. Last year, we started using Calm Classroom and mindfulness and taking time to breathe. And we will be more intentional about doing that as well, as well as integrating some mindful schools throughout all divisions of Royce Moore. So from lower school, middle school, and upper school as well. As a school at the end of last year, we started a gratitude, a school-wide gratitude project, which we're gonna continue this year. And just giving three, three gratitudes a day is such a gift and be able to share them with other people in our school. And just with our small class sizes and being able to make connections is one of you know, the important ways that Royce Moore is still maintaining its family. So aligned with that, one of the things I know is a question on people's minds is just the focus and the care that we're gonna take when coming back to school and thinking of how we're gonna practice those roads sorry, routines of washing hands, how to wear our mask. What does it look like to wear a mask appropriately, right? Is it sitting on our chin? When we're in school, we'll talk about, you know, it's over your nose and it covers your mouth. And then also give the reason why do we do that? I think that it's, you know, being intentional in that way is so important as well. So again, I'm so excited to see everyone back at campus and I am excited to hear what Adrian Floro has to say about middle school. Thank you so much, Darcy, and hello, everyone. Good evening. I am so happy to be here and excited to share the work that we've been planning with all of you. So this summer, we saw firsthand how different age groups of our campers responded to the health and safety procedures and protocols with varying levels of ease. Surprisingly or not, to some of you, our middle school campers struggled a bit more than our littles with handling the masking and distancing. For that reason, I'm really asking all my middle school parents for help in getting your kids ready to return to school. By number one, building in capacity with masks. So if your child has not been wearing a mask frequently this summer, I would ask in the days leading up to school to kind of set a challenge. Choose an activity that your, your child likes to do, whether it's playing video games or watching TV or perhaps reading 
And each day when they're doing that activity, ask them to wear a mask. And then each day add a few minutes on so that hopefully by the time uh, we return to school, they're comfortable wearing a mask for an extended period of time. Another challenge we saw in middle school with, I mean, excuse me, with our uh, summer camp program with our middle level learners was the social distancing. Um, they have been apart for five months. They miss their friends terribly and they just want to jump on them and hug them and be connected. Um, so in that regard as, as well, asking for your help and just getting them acclimated and accustomed to that six foot arm span distance. I mean, even playing a freeze tag game in your family room where everyone runs around and stops and try to see if you're really six feet apart. So any fun way that you can incorporate into practicing, understanding and keeping that distance would be greatly appreciated and really ease their transition back to school. Um, another thing we saw was that students would often kind of congregate together around an object that one of them had. And we really want to make sure that they understand that they have to have their own supplies and their own objects and they can't congregate looking at something or, or gathering around an item. Um, they've got to maintain that six foot separation. Um, we really must get the health and safety part correct right out of the gate. We, and that's why we want to spend our first week in a modified schedule because we truly believe if we teach it and we learn it and we practice it, we're not going to have to be focusing on it week after week. We're going to get it down pat that first week. So we're going to have a modified schedule um, for the week of August 25th to the 28th. The purpose there, we've got two parts. One is the health and safety piece that is critical for us. Learning, practicing, and really coming to own those procedures and, and routines within the school. The second part is the reconnect. Uh, we have new teachers and we have um, new students. We also have plenty of returning teachers and students. We've been through a lot as, as a school community and as a nation and as a world. We've been isolated for five months. It is so important for us to allow all of us to come together, enjoy, and build relationships and connect and laugh. So really that first week, we're not gonna address curriculum per se. We're gonna do activities, but it's really very focused on the health and safety protocols and procedures and the relationship and the reconnection and the communication piece. So in order to really master this, we felt it would be best to have the students in smaller groups. So I've, I've split this middle school student body in half. Group one is the first part of the alphabet. And it's a little di different um, alphabetically for each grade level. So group one will come to school on Tuesday the 25th and Friday the 28th. In fifth grade, it would be the students with last names beginning with A through M. Sixth grade it would be students last names beginning A through R. And seventh and eighth grade, students with last names beginning A through K. Group two is now the second half of the alphabet. They will come in on Wednesday and Thursday, the 26th and 27th. And just to explain why this has been separated the way it has, um, because of the block schedule, our students go to the same four classes on Monday and Wednesday. And then they go to the other four block classes on Tuesday and Thursday, and they see all their classes for a shorter period of time on Friday. So I wanted to make sure that both groups of students had the opportunity to walk through and practice the procedures and the pathways and the routines for all of their classes. So that is why it's Tuesday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so the group two, again, it would be uh, fifth grade N through Z, sixth grade S through Z, and seventh and eighth grade L through Z. And just as a, as a note, if your child is a middle school student that is enrolled in an upper school, either math or world language class, they will not be using this modified schedule. So your child should plan on zooming into that class during that week. You can switch the slide, please. 
So we have two orientations planned, both from Monday, August 24th. Uh, we have the new student orientation that will be happening in person for new students only from 10.30 a.m. till noon. And we have an off-campus student orientation with Mr. Tain, who is our off-campus learning coordinator. Mr. Tain will be sending out a Zoom link for that Monday, August 24th, 1 p.m. meeting to the students that have selected um, to be off campus. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the important features of our middle school off campus learning experience. Um, things that are important to point out. And these features that are true for on campus learners and off campus learners are also very true if we were uh, required to suddenly move into remote by the governor. Um, we heard a little bit about uh, the block schedule. This is where it really comes in. When we were thinking about being in this pandemic era and needing to be responsive and to be able to pivot very quickly, having a block schedule where students have fewer classes for longer periods of time really made sense. It resonated with us. Um, and so we created that, created that to really have be able to create a seamless transition from on campus to off campus and to serve the needs um, of both capacities in addition um, if we were also deeply in remote. The other wonderful benefit of block scheduling is that you have 80 minute blocks of time. That really allows our students to take a deeper dive into their learning and have more time and it also allows for cross-curricular project-based learning that is, that is growing and developing um, at Orsmore and also very specifically at the middle school. Our teachers will be planning synchronous and very strategic Zoom lessons. And, and Darcy alluded to this a little bit. But, you know, we fundamentally believe that having students sit um, off campus staring at a computer screen for seven or eight hours a day is inappropriate and disrespectful. So we really wanted to think about how do we structure our time so that students are really getting the benefit from it, whether in class or um, at home. And the idea of teachers thinking about their schedule and planning their schedule around notions of when am I doing direct instruction? When am I doing a demonstration? When will there be a presentation? How about student discussion and collaboration? So they would be inviting the students that are off campus specifically to come in at that time. The beauty of block schedule is that because of the extended time, you've got your instructional time, but you also have the deep dive personal learning time. So on campus, our students would do the deep dive personal learning within the classroom. Our off campus students would do that um, asynchronously within their own home and their own study setting. Um, another wonderful feature that we have is Google Classroom. It really is um, the resource that will support all of our learners, regardless of where they are. All of the PowerPoints, um, all of the assignments, documents, videos, students can submit assignments, students will receive feedback on their work. It's all housed within Google Classroom. So that is a tool that we've used in the past, but it is just really much more robust and efficient for um, sharing and documenting work and students also collaborating through Google Classroom their work. Um, we also feel that the social connection piece is so important for our off-campus learners. And we're going to, I'll talk a little bit more later, but create opportunities for them to engage socially as well, because they need to be connected with their peers um, and, and have those social opportunities. Um, one of the things we will be sharing out with you is the middle school off campus slash remote learning contract. Um, the spring really taught us a lot about remote learning or off campus learning. And we found the areas where students have struggled. So we've worked on that together. In fact, um, several of the middle school teachers really took the lead in terms of developing this because they thought back on the challenges and the missteps 
in the spring and where his students really seem to struggle. And so through this document, we've created a, a very specific scaffolded support. Um, and it really spells out the role of the student, the role of the teacher, and the role of home, the family, and how we can all work together to support the student. So I'm gonna make sure you, uh, you see that shortly um, because it really is powerful in terms of, you know, where we were in the spring and where we are now, we've certainly learned an awful lot. You can switch to the next slide, please. You switch to the next slide, please. This is it. Okay, I'm sorry, I was, I was looking at that one. Okay, so one of the questions that came up was concerns about engagement. We recognize that parents have concerns about their kids' level of engagement, and really whether you're at home or at school, engagement is a key consideration for us all. So this chart here that I'm sharing with you really looks at engagement, and, and you can look at students being actively disengaged, and certainly we want our students to be actively engaged. Um, you look at some of the behaviors that would be happening in terms of just, you know, off task, disconnected. Um, that doesn't work and it can happen anywhere. But what I have to say is Royce Moore is on the investing and the driving side because agency and voice and autonomy are key elements of Royce Moore. I came to Royce Moore primarily because of the culture of student engagement. Whether we're talking about JST, P3, Experience Week, the student-led conferencing, and now the expansion of project-based learning. As standard practice, Royce Moore puts kids in the driver's seat of their own learning, and it really doesn't matter whether that seat is here at school or at home. I'm sorry, I think I missed a slide. We can. Okay, yes. So we ta I talked a little bit about the social piece and also the social emotional piece. So our homeroom is going to run from 8.20 to 9 o'clock every day. And we recognize that this year more than any year, um, we need to provide opportunities for social emotional development as, and, and growth. Students both at school and at home are going to start the day together in homeroom. The structure of our daily homeroom is all about connection, communication, community, and self-development, with some executive functioning strategies and mindfulness infused. Then when students transition to advisory lunch and recess midday, that morning conversation will continue within the smaller advisory groups of fifth, sixth grade, and seventh and eighth grade. That social connection piece, as I said, is really important. Um, when the weather is really nice, I'm sure the students will want to be outside for lunch and recess, but I can imagine a time where students are setting up Zoom lunches with their friends that are off campus or Zoom recess where they're playing a game. And those are opportunities that we really want to foster and develop because um, in addition to the educational development, we want to make sure we're really being mindful of the social development and the social emotional needs of all of our learners. Um, so that is it for me and I now turn it over to Stephanie. Thanks everybody. Hi everybody. So nice to be here. Um, I'm also excited to be able to share our, our plans with you, more details of our plans with you. Um, I'm going to jump right in. So much of this will sound, uh, will, will be and sound very similar to what uh, Adrian Floro and uh, Darsky Eximatowski already shared. Um, so forgive me if it's a little repetitive. Uh, what is different is uh, that first week of school will not actually, is not modified differently for upper school. So for upper school, the Monday the 24th is orientation for all new students, including all ninth graders. Um, and then Tuesday is a, is a full day of school. On Tuesday, we will be doing some of those uh, routines and health and safety measure protocols during that day, but it will be a regular school day and school week for all students uh, for the rest of that week. 
So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about on-campus versus off-campus learners. Um, we have a lot in place to support our off-campus learners. Um, and what it will look like is, the main difference is that, like, like Adrian Floro said, uh, we are not expecting the off-campus learners to sit in front of a screen from 8.30 to 3.30. It won't be structured like that. And teachers have spent the summer working super, super hard on the best possible remote plans. And of course, some of that will work really well for the off-campus students. Um, it is going to vary from teacher to teacher and subject area to subject area, of course. And teachers will modify and adjust as they go along, as they do in in-person teaching as well so that's going to be happening um i get, put some examples here of how what it might look like to help you be able to envision it um, so for example let's say your student is off campus and they're in biology they might zoom in with a partner to work on a lab and then get off zoom and maybe head outside to complete that that lab report independently so they wouldn't be sitting on Zoom for that entire 80 minutes. Um, or, you know, in English class, uh, they're reading a novel. They would read and write a reflection independently and then come into the class for the Zoom discussion on what was read and reflected on. So those are just some examples of, of what that off-campus learning would look like. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have a remote learning contract that we're fine tuning right now, but it really does, a, I think, a really good job of outlining everyone's responsibilities for off campus learning. So that's student responsibilities, teacher responsibilities, and parent responsibilities as well. Um, and in addition, we have the wonderful, wonderful Mr. Ron Tain. Um, he will be our off campus coordinator. So he is an extra resource for all the students who are off campus to be in touch with and he will be doing check-ins and that orientation and all sorts of stuff. And for those of you who know Ron, he's tremendous. And those of you who don't know him yet, you will come to find he is amazing. So I just wanted to mention that he will be an additional resource there. You can go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, so wanted to talk a little bit about the block schedule with the two days of 80 minutes and then one day of 45. Um, and just some of the benefits there to kind of add on to what Darcy and Adrian already mentioned. Um, so yes, it does allow for a deeper dive. Um, it also is, in particular for upper school students, it provides them less daily homework. So they wouldn't have homework for every sim single subject that they're taking every single day. So it actually is much more easy to, to time manage, right? Um, so that's a really nice added benefit of, of a block schedule. Um, additionally, it, it promotes cooperative learning and individual check-ins. So if a teacher has 80 minutes, they have more time to check in with individual students during those 80 minutes. And like I said, our teachers have been working so hard this summer to prepare just the, the best possible learning for both off campus and on campus. Um, oh, also the block schedule allows for a much, much easier switch between should we have to go fully remote between remote and in person. Um, so the schedule wouldn't change a whole lot between being remote or being on campus. Um, it, of course, some classes it will look a little different like PE, for example, or drama or music. Um, but like I said, our teachers have spent a tremendous amount of time preparing the best possible remote plan. So it's so tremendously different from what happened this past March where all of a sudden we were in remote learning, um, but rather this time we're set, we're ready. Set, ready, set, go, right? We're ready to do that remote learning and the teachers worked really hard to, um, to be ready for that. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that we have a really cool new app, um, Atlas. It's a, it's a, it basically it supports student wellness through um, journaling and also through a number of podcasts and lessons. Some of those lessons will happen in advisory um, and the podcasts 
are designed to alleviate stress, to manage pressure, and to develop healthy relationships and to get better sleep. All of those are things that our upper school students struggle with. That's, you know, that's the, the time where that happens. And so we are offering this app to all of our students to help with those, with those things. That's really all I have to add. And I will now hand it over to Both Long, our brand new athletic director. Hi, um, I am new to Royce Moore, I'm new to Evanston and Trust me when I say I would much rather have had a different um, meeting and introduction to the community. This has been a great um, and fast paced onboarding process and it's been a pleasure to see so many smiling faces um, on campus and off campus working together to put forward a very well thought out and um, resilient plan. Uh, I'm here to share with you some athletics and some PE updates, um, primarily I want to come out and say the first chunk of my work uh, with Royce Moore has been to catch myself up with the IHSA, the Illinois High School Association, and the uh, IESA, um, Illinois Elementary School Association, and just get a pulse of the pattern and um, trends of their decision making regarding sports, competitive sports in the fall. Um, there's been a lot of pause and there's been a lot of uh, decision making that has shifted around and really just presented a fluid landscape for us to look at uh, as late as this past end of July, there, there's been more updates on the HSA um, as to what's allowed and as to what is given the green light for sports programming. Unfortunately, there's still so much in the air and there's still so much un unknown, even from the HSA. Um, they've shifted recently to the further decision making um, to the higher ups and really lean on Governor Pritzker uh, to come forward and, and make a decision about sports in the fall. Um, in light of the trends and in light of the diff different decisions that have been made thus far um, with the HSA and following their guidelines and then contacting different ADs in the area, Royce Moore has made the diff difficult decision to move away from athletic interscholastic competitions for the fall. Winter and spring is still being assessed and there are all kinds of creative ways to get the fall sports season back into the fold later on in this calendar year or the ad academic year. But right now we think as a community, hearing from other schools and hearing from other ADs, it's better to focus on our community and better to focus on what we can control here. Um, we want to put our community first and we want to ensure that our students are as safe as possible in this uncertain time. We're constantly assessing what it will be like uh, down the line, whether or not it will be appropriate to revisit these conversations in the winter or spring. At the moment, um, I can say that it's a pause and we are hoping to bounce back even stronger when we do go back to competitive uh, competitive sports. Um, I am a competitive person by nature. I love competitions. I love games. Soccer is my, my passion. I believe that the competitive atmosphere is one of the best learning environments for young students. And it will be missed uh, dearly by all of us. And I'm sure together we can definitely push on forward to set ourselves up for um, that first step or that restart when, when, when it does happen. Um, that brings me to kind of new programming. We realize that there is this void um, that's been left by competitive sports and we're still committed to serving our students and indirectly our families. We believe that healthy minds and healthy bodies is the best way to get through um, such an uncertain time and, and a lot of that work falls on us as a department um, invested in athletic, physical education, and health in general, health and wellness. Um, some of the on-campus programming regarding our athletic afternoon commitments um, are going through a redesigning, reimagining process. Uh, we are looking to implement and hold, uh, hold true to the guidelines set forward by um, our school return to campus plan. Um, we wanna respect 
social distancing, mask wearing, and um, limit the use of shared materials when possible. Washing of hands and general hygiene will be interwoven into our curriculum. Traditional offerings will still be put forward. So soccer, cross country, and girls volleyball are historically um, present fall sports will still be there. It just will not look like it has been in the past, in the past years. Um, it'll be more skills-based. It'll be more focused on the technical aspects of the sport. So for soccer, while we are not going to be having intramural uh, scrimmages or matches between the students on campus, we will be working on foot skills, uh, technical sessions. Um, there will be a general fitness that is through the lens of soccer. So some of the body weight exercises, some of the fitness will be geared towards soccer curriculum. The same with volleyball. Um, for cross country, we are happy and very excited to welcome back the sport with some level of familiarity. Coaches will be instructed on how to keep our students safe um, during their programming. But the best part about that is that they're running outside and they're, they're getting some fresh air where they can. We also realize that our, half our students or a lot of our students are going to be at home during this time and we still want to give them the sport experience, give them experience of connecting with their community. And for that, we will be also moving to have some of our programming um, in the form of asynchronous content in a Google Classroom. So if a student misses soccer or misses volleyball, or misses cross country and, and is from home, they will be able to log into and see what was the workout for the day and see what the team is doing. We're doing our best to connect everybody with, it, with each other and, and really just um, present our students an opportunity to tap into the core essentials of sport. And that's really community and, and team-based um, learning. While we can't compete with other schools and compete in games and meets uh, like we want to, we do, we do want to explore other recreational activities, other activities that maybe are less traditional or less orthodox. Um, there will be a, a short survey coming out just uh, um, soon after this call ends. And we're gonna take a, a pulse on level of interest uh, regarding ping pong, fencing, mini golf, e-gaming, and general recreational sports such as kickball or badminton. Um, and really uses time as an opportunity for us to see what else is out there for us. Uh, we're not wedded, we're not bound to just three sports um, and looking at uh, a sports schedule to, to define our, our experience this coming fall. Um, I just got off the phone yesterday with our fencing co uh, contact and we're looking at a, a fencing program where students are going to be able to tap into an entry level uh, beginners kind of fencing club and really just test the waters and see how they feel about it. This will be offered for middle school and upper school after, after school programming. Um, unlike years past, we cannot have middle school and upper school sports practice together. There has been some fluidity, there has been some moving up and down of older eighth graders and um, kind of lumping middle school and, and upper school cross country together, respecting everything that is being done in lower school, middle school, and upper school on the academic side, we're going to follow that model and also separate our group. So there will be a middle school block of time after school ends for um, athletics. And then after that ends, there will be a, a buffer window between the two groups where upper school will come in and roll in. This is a plan that we have for now. And we, we just ask that um, our, you know, our students are good about the, the, the punctuality of, of transitions. And we will also be asking our faculty members to help out with that, knowing that this has to be a little bit tighter in terms of scheduling than, than past years. We're definitely um, looking to coordinate and collaborate on being punctual with, with some of our dismissal times and some of our arrival times. Um, fencing in particular has, has said that their, their window for us has um, 
is a bit tight because of other schools in the area also tapping into the, uh, the fencing resource. I am now shifting over to our modified PE curriculum. So Darcy and Adrian and Stephanie have also kind of just touched a little bit on, on PE and what that would look like or how that will change in the fall. Um, just flat out, it will be different. It will have to be um, a, a collaborative work experience between teacher, a PE teacher and students. We all need to work together to ensure that we're using the space as efficiently, but also as safely as possible. So um, six feet apart at all times and really focusing on the general wellness of the student. Um, again, healthy bodies, healthy minds uh, will be the work at hand and we're gonna do that with um, fun games that will allow for kids to be fully involved and fully engaged in the activity without seeming almost too rigid or too robotic um, given the, the gathering protocol. So an idea is something like noodle tag or um, relay races um, and different PE curriculum that is modeling some of our, our programming in, in af af afternoon sports. Um, we're looking at units to kind of structure our, um, our journey through the curriculum. So there will be a, a, a cross country unit, there'll be a soccer unit, there'll be a volleyball unit, there'll be um, a racquetball um, unit. And within those units, we'll have a differentiated experience for, um, for students to, to take part in. And we realized that the, you know, the, experience at home is a little bit different and, and you're missing your, your classmates um, to, to really kind of feed off of that energy and, and feed off of that, that positive experience. We will record sessions where we can and we'll also look to gamify the learning experience um, for at-home students. So there'll be healthy and fun co competitive challenges, something like posting a video onto Google Classroom of you juggling a random, a random object that's not soccer ball. Um, or spiking a, a water balloon um, into the ground to kind of resemble uh, our volleyball um, techniques and, and practices. Um, and then different running challenges like, like cross country and looking to really tie in and, and keep our students at home um, as part of our, our team as possible. I've mentioned this before, our content on Google Classroom will be for primarily for at-home students. It'll also serve as our plan B or card in the back pocket for any possible interruption. Um, we're hoping to have synchronous and asynchronous content for our students and definitely use that, that space, that virtual space for um, really an, an agile and, and, and quick response to any changes that, that we may face this coming fall. Um, Open as ready and responsible uh, in this in this time. And oh, sorry, just my, my last little piece here. Um, shifting back to on-campus learning uh, for PE, we are also going to be sorting our equipment by cohort. So I've gone through already and sorted through the lower school equipment, and the lower school equipment has been put aside already with the help of Darcy. Um, tomorrow I will be going in to sort through the middle school and upper school equipment so that we have PE um, bins for each group and each bin will be able to be sanitized after use each day. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, nice meeting. Well, welcome back everybody. Uh, thank you both for sharing so much about our athletic and PE program and everyone else who has shared about uh, their programs as well. Uh, it is now 6.30. Uh, we do have one question in the Q&A and maybe we can answer that one. It looks like a lot of other uh, questions got answered in the course of uh, the commentary. Uh, and this is a question about lower school and lower school for off-campus learners. How long are the 
three synchronous lessons and are they all with the main class teacher so the students will not be with their specialty course teachers? Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, great question. And I think that the importance of the question is really thinking about how we work in partnership together. Um, when you're looking in the lower school, you have age ranges from your three-year-olds all the way up until your fourth graders and looking at the class structure. Um, I think it is important to talk about, as you've heard through this programming, that the middle and, um, middle and upper school are doing a different type of off-campus learner. And it was very intentional in working with the program of thinking about what makes sense with the class structure and the way that we teach in the lower school. And when you're teaching in the lower school, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of workshop model, and it's a dynamic structure. There, if you say you're gonna start a class at 10 a.m., like that's when math starts and that's when you can start Zooming in middle school, typically in my 17 years of teaching, math doesn't start at 10 a.m. It starts at maybe 10, 12, right? Or it might start early, or someone has to go get a drink, or something happens. So again, being intentional and in, in partnership with each other, to create a plan that works for your child, the classroom that your child is in, and providing that experience. So, for example, if there are opportunities for your child to do a zoomed in reading group, looking at that and seeing how long that group would be that they can participate. Maybe they come for the mini lesson and then they go and work by themselves. But again, working together, having those conversations, looking at the schedule of the particular first, second, pre-K, J-K class that the child is in and being able to develop that plan together that makes sense for your home life as well. And again, fostering that independence so that they can be successful in this off-campus learning plan. Thank you, Darcy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the kind of common themes that you've heard tonight from all of our administrators is the spirit of partnership with you as parents, as well as our commitment to support the individual students. And so we may not have addressed every single detail tonight. I'm sure we haven't. Um, I'm cognizant that it is now 633 and we've taken up a lot of your evening. But I want to encourage you to communicate with us, reach out, talk to the individual division heads, um, talk with us about um, your hopes and dreams for your children this year and how we can support you and your family dur during these extraordinary times that we're living in. Um, hopefully this is a once in a lifetime occurrence for us and your kids, but I do appreciate so much the incredible work that's gone into these plans by this amazing team that is here to support your children. And I also appreciate so much the sense of partnership that each of you bring in your work with us at Royce Moore. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight and reach out, talk to us, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.